All right. Well, it is just after 11, so I'm going to recommend we go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. I'm sure there'll be more people dropping in. Um, there's a lot of people signed up for this. So I we got a lot of content, though, so I'll jump right in. Uh, please just know my preference is to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, I'd like to tell people we're doing this for your benefit, not ours. So I know all the information, but if I'm not answering a question, if there's something you want to know, by all means, please just uh, put it in the chat. I've got that up on one of my many screens here, and I should be able to respond. Um, if I don't respond right away, I might just kind of finish the thought that I'm on and then come back to it. But by all means, please uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you have. So with that, I am going to go ahead and just get us started here. I think also I'm required to let you know we are recording this just in case people weren't able to attend or if we want to send it out to everybody so you guys can watch it again if you didn't get enough the first time. Uh, so I want to start off just with a quick introduction of who Paragus is. Some of you may be familiar with us, some maybe not. Uh, we are about a 50 person managed service company in Hadley, Massachusetts. We exclusively support small businesses in Western Mass and Connecticut and help them with everything and anything IT related. Sometimes we are in a company's entire IT department, meaning where their help desk, their security, their compliance, uh, their strategist, and sometimes we're supplementing what they already have in-house. Um, but either way, we can work with small businesses to help make sure that everything they need from an IT perspective is covered. And manufacturing is a huge focus of ours. It's probably uh, about a third of our business, maybe even a little bit more. And part of that actually comes from my own history. I grew up in a manufacturing company. Uh, I love manufacturing. I love manufacturers. And so it's always been an important focus of our own business model. Uh, even though IT is very different than manufacturing, uh, we certainly have a lot of respect and love for companies that at the end of the day get to make something. Uh, that's something that we envy and don't get to do in our own line of work. Uh, but without any further ado, let me go ahead and jump into today's content. Oh, and the other thing I didn't mention, I apologize, is that we are an employee-owned company, which means that everybody who works here uh, is a part owner of the company. So this can be a very confusing topic, and that's why we wanted to put this webinar together today. There has been a lot going on, and it's been an ever-changing topic. And so we thought it would be helpful to just kind of put together a summary of everything that's happening that affects small, medium uh, manufacturers in our community. So part of the reason this is so confusing is it's not only federal, but you also have other departments coming in. Uh, there's rules that apply to large companies that are being imposed on small companies, and it's a moving target. It's been changing constantly. So we'll start off with NIST. NIST is probably one of the most important pieces of this, and we'll be talking about their role in all of that. But it isn't just NIST. On top of NIST, we also have to worry about things like PCI, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts data privacy law, GDPR. California just came out with their data privacy law. So there's a lot of different governing bodies at play here. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this is such a confusing topic is it isn't as easy as just following one organization. It would be great if our federal government uh, condensed all of this into one set of rules and regulations, but we're not there. Uh, and I honestly don't see us getting there anytime soon. The other challenge we're seeing is that the same rules that apply to these guys apply to you. And that's hard. It's hard when the government writes rules that are meant for companies like Pratt & Whitney, and then they impose those rules on the entire supply chain all the way down to the small manufacturers. Um, and so that's part of what makes this confusing is trying to navigate how does that apply to us. And it isn't always just kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. Sometimes it's a as it fits or best case or within certain guidelines. There's these kind of words that they use to help to kind of narrow that down a little bit. And we can talk a little bit about more of what that looks like. Uh, the other thing is just, it's constantly changing. Um, every week, every day, there's been some new gov direction. Some of it is interpretation of the law. There's been some great blogs and articles out there by law professionals who are interpreting the laws and writing kind of their interpretations and how that applies to different size organizations. But then you also have things like the interim ruling that was one of the precursors for this conversation today, where the DOD came out and they had said something, and then they decided they were going to circumvent that and create an interim ruling to, uh, that supersedes their previous ruling. So there's a lot of moving targets here, and that definitely makes the topic more confusing and complicated. And then the other thing, just to kind of put a fine point on this, they love their acronyms. Uh, the government, the compliance organizations, they love using acronyms. And sometimes those acronyms track of. 
Um, this is just a small sample of some of the acronyms that are out there. Uh, and I'm curious uh, how many people could name these. We'll start with POEM. Does anybody know what POEM stands for? You can post in the chat, you can unmute, whatever's easier. So POEM is your plan of action uh, milestones. So part of your DOD regulations is you have to file a POEM for any regulation that you're not currently in compliance with. It's basically an acronym that represents we're not in compliance with this, but we have a plan to get there. Uh, and that would be your POEM. So your POEM is going to accompany some of your uh, certification requirements. And it's kind of a hand in hand. You have your document that says, here's what we're currently compliant with. And here's our POEM to get us compliant. I imagine most of you know who the DOD is. Uh, if you don't, that's the Department of Defense. CUI is Controlled Unclassified Information. Uh, so CUI comes up a lot in the different documentations and regulations. And what it really pertains to is deciding what information that would be applicable. So if it's controlled unclassified information, then we have to apply this guideline to it. If I'm a classified information, and it's an entirely different set of regulations that we're not talking about today. Uh, and then you have NIST, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, National Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, COTS, which is commercially available off the shelf. What's interesting about COTS is any products you make that are considered commercially available do not have to meet the guidelines that we're talking about today. So some of you might manufacture parts that are so widely distributed and commercially available that they don't have to meet these guidelines. But most of you who are in any kind of a supply chain relationship or you're supplying parts that are ultimately getting provided to some sort of a DOD contract would not typically fit into that category. Then you've got DFARS, which is the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation. That's where a lot of this regulation is actually coming from. Um, SP stands for the Supplemental Program, and that's where we're looking at a lot of these regulations are being promoted from, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, CMMC, most of you are probably familiar with. The SPRS is the uh, specific regulation that we're going to spend some time on today, which talks about the Supplier Performance Risk System, um, and that's where a lot of the DOD stuff is focused on. All right, so the most important thing is what do you guys need to know? I shared those slides just to kind of help to highlight and illustrate the point that yes, this is complicated. Yes, there's a lot going on, but it's not that complicated and it can be simplified down, which is really what we're hoping that you guys will walk away uh, from this presentation today with. So let's start with the NIST 800-171 compliance. Uh, if you are in the supply chain of any DOD contract, Starting on November 30th, which is already passed, any new contract that you want to bid on, you have to have self-certified yourself against NIST 800-171. For anybody who doesn't know what that means, uh, NIST 800-171 has about 110 different requirements to it. And what you have to do is go through a list of all 110 requirements and you have to score whether or not you're in compliant with each of those 110 requirements. In doing so, each of them is weighted. So some of them are worth three points, some are worth five points, and you're gonna go through the process of deciding, am I compliant with each of these 110 requirements? And then I'm gonna take the score for all the ones that I'm compliant with and add up my points. When I've completed that, I then have to draft that poem, which we talked about a minute ago. That's the plan of action uh, and milestones of how you are going to address the ones that you weren't compliant with. Those two documents have to be submitted to the DOD. And for any of you who are not prime DOD contractors, which I'm going to assume is most of you, you don't, can't log into the DOD's portal directly. So what you're going to do is you're going to take those two documents, the list of the 110 requirements and how you did, and your poem to address the ones that you're not compliant with. Both of those documents have to be emailed to a very specific email address at the Navy. Uh, that email address at the Navy is responsible for collecting all this information on supply chain manufacturers who are not prime contractors. And then they record it in their system to show that you have self-certified your NIST 800-171 compliance. So why do you have to do this? You have to do this because there was an interim ruling earlier this year that said, as we work towards the CMMC compliance, which we'll be talking about in just a minute, 
an interim step that we would like everybody to do is just kind of do a self-assessment of where you are today. Basically what happened was there was a lot of cybersecurity events going on. The defense department was getting a lot of pressure saying we need to tighten this up. Waiting until 2025 is too long. We need to do something faster. We wanna get a better picture of where everybody's at and we want that to be much more transparent. So what they did was they came out with this interim ruling. It was released in about September of this year and they said by November, all new contracts going forward in order for a supply contractor to participate in that contract, they need to have done this self-certification assignment and we want the results. We don't just want them to do it and put it in their files like other compliance bodies. We actually want it emailed to us so that we have a paper copy of it or digital copy of it. So I just want to pause there because that's a probably one, of the, it's the most time sensitive piece of everything we're going to talk about today. Everything else we're going to talk about, you have more time on, but this is the one that technically speaking, any new contracts you want to bid on today that are part of a DOD supply chain will require you to do the self-certification exercise. Um, so if there's any questions on that, it'd be a good time to answer them now before I move on. Dulce, uh, my name is David. I've actually just helped a company do this exact thing. Um, in order to get a bid. And I just wanted to mention that they were not actually required to hand in their poem. All they needed to do was the full NIST assessment and get a value, which actually for them turned out to be negative. Um, so as far as that scoring goes, you get, so, so something's worth five, it's only worth five points in a negative sense. It's only worth one point if you completed it. So your sure. total yeah. score could be 110 yeah. Uh, but you're, you could be negative 107, which is what they were. Yes. So I just and wanted to build that up. Yeah, that is an important clarification. And there are two different people that you may have to submit these self-certifications to. So what the interim ruling said is they want everything emailed to the Navy. Uh, and in that interim ruling, they do say they would like a copy of your poem. What I think you're referring to, and you're 100% correct, is the actual prime contractor themselves may also reach out to you and say, we would like a copy of your NIST compliance. They may or may not ask for your poem. That is entirely at their own discretion, and they're not legally required to ask for that. They can go to the Navy or to the Department of Defense and confirm that you have self-certified through them. But a lot of them, to your point, David, we are seeing they're going to their supply chain and asking for their supply chain to provide them their self-certification that they did on their own. So that's that's true. So I'm working with two companies right now. One is an engineering firm that has primes. The other one does not. Uh, so the one that does not is uh, they develop unique hardware and software. They won awards directly. Essentially, they are their own prime. In order to win the award, they were not required to hand in the poem. So at the moment, if you write to that uh, email address, which is navy.mil, um, and you say, what do I need? They actually send back a list of, I think, six things. So you have to list, uh, I'm going from memory here. You have to list your certification, you know, what's your value of your NIST assessment. You need to list, you know, what your company name is, what your cage number is, and then your enterprise, what, what type of architecture are you, uh, which in their case is an enterprise, because you get per project, per enterprise, or per or like segment of your enterprise. Um, so there was a few things that required, but at this time, I think they're so overwhelmed that they just simply don't have the, the number of personnel to keep up with actually going through your poem. So at this stage, if you get your NIST in assessment now, they'll, they'll accept your number without a poem, but at some point they're gonna want your SSP as well as your poem. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I, the other thing that's what been the topic that everybody's kind of paying very close attention to is what is the Department of Defense doing with these self-assessments? Are they actually looking at them? Are they looking at the poems? Are they putting any credence on the actual score you get? And this is an area of a little bit of controversy right now because some people are a little concerned about submitting a report either to the DOD directly or to the prime that is, you know, a significant negative score. What all the fine print says right now is that they simply want the record of the exercise. They're not actually applying any decision-making thought process to what that score is. So they're saying it's kind of like a safe harbor. We don't care how bad it is. We just want it documented and we want you to know what it is and have gone through that documentation exercise. Now, I think where there leaves some room for speculation is could the primes themselves choose to prioritize a supplier that has a higher score and require them to submit their scores. Obviously that's subjective, but it could happen. 
And at some point, and I don't think it'll be that much further down the road, you could see another interim ruling for the DOD that says we want all manufacturers in the supply chain to get to at least this score. Uh, and by this date. And I think that's likely what the tea leaves are indicating is that there's probably going to be another interim ruling between now and the CMMC timeline, which we'll talk about in a minute, that does put a little bit more pressure to get that done sooner. Any other questions on the interim ruling and the self-certification process? All right, we will move on then. So the next thing is talking about the CMMC process. And this is one that I'm sure you guys have probably all heard a lot about. Um, this is, was announced about a year ago now, and this came to the Department of Defense. And what they said was they were gonna create their own certification program aside from NIST, but that was gonna leverage NIST and rely on NIST to have their own simplified version of certification. And they produced this chart that was gonna have these five levels uh, and the five levels were going to be at what level each company was going to be certified. And the other thing they said was that these were not going to be self-certification processes. They were going to form a piece of the government that was going to certify private contractors to be certification bodies that you would then hire to come in and do your certification, but that you would not be able to self-assess your certification on this. There has been some interim rulings and some changes, and that's one of those things that's kind of a moving target right now. Because of COVID and other reasons, they were way behind schedule on actually coming up with the regulations for the certification companies. Those have been finally produced, and it is actually now possible for an independent private contractor to sign up to become a certifier for CMMC. Uh, and there are now companies starting to go through that process, but it's a long, expensive process. It requires some mentorship from some people who have already been certified. So it's a little bit of like chicken and egg, but there are businesses working through that process right now. And those certification organizations will exist and be able to help organizations achieve a certified score uh, in the near future. One of the other things that was kind of a common misconception about this is exactly when it's going to go into effect. And so if you read the DOD language very clearly, what it says is that by December, I'm sorry, by November of 2025, all DOD contracts will require some level of CMMC. So every contract that comes out will be stamped either level one through five, and anybody who participates in that contract, all the supply chain down, will need to achieve that level of certification for that contract. Some of them may even state this at the DOD level and this at the, at the subcontracting level. However, what isn't clear is what happens between today and that day in the future. And that's up to a little bit of speculation. So what we're seeing right now is it doesn't look like there's any indication that any DOD contracts are going to require CMMC certification in 2021. The general kind of understanding, again, reading of the tea leaves, is that 2021 is going to be the year where they really focus on getting enough of these certifiers out there, getting the certifiers to go out and start certifying companies, and that the earliest we would start to see actual DOD contracts require certified CMMC would probably be 2022, somewhere around there. Now, at that point, it's entirely discretionary. Until 2025, it's at the discretion of the DOD. So as they're issuing contracts, they can decide whether or not they're going to require certification. Um, and that'll be a little bit of a moving target to understand what is the logic they're gonna use? When are they gonna require it? When are they not? How is that actually gonna work? And that's one of the things that we're all paying very close attention to to see what is that gonna look like? But we know that by 2025, we are gonna require it. The advice we've been giving a lot of our manufacturing clients is talk to your primes. Talk to the people that you're working with and what is their take on it? What's their approach? When are they gonna get certified? At what level are they achieving certification? Kind of what timeline are they operating on? Because if you don't ever need to be ahead of your primes, if you know who your customers are and where they're at, and as long as you stay kind of aligned with that, you're not gonna get in a position where they're requiring something that you don't have because they haven't gotten it yet either. So that would be one of the best things I could recommend is talk to your uh, customers, figure out where they're at in their CMMC journey and how they're approaching their timeline. And I would try to stay pretty close on their heels, uh, try to mimic what they're trying to do. Some of the other things that I would just kind of point out is for the most part, and I don't know everybody on this call, but I feel like I can probably pretty safely say level one and level three are probably the only two levels that are going to apply to this group of people. 
Uh, level four and five are really reserved at the highest, highest level. They're only gonna be certified by the DOD themselves. So they're not gonna let these certification organizations go out and certify level four and five. They're only gonna certify one, three. The other thing to understand is that level two is not really a real level. It's like an interim level. Uh, level one's a real level and level three is a real level. Level two is kind of like a middle ground between level one and level three. It's an interim step towards level three certification, but you're not going to see contracts as what we're being told by the DOD stamped as level two. They're either going to be stamped level one or level three. Any questions on the CMMC's piece before we move on? All right, we will keep going. So all of that is the stuff that we know right now. We know that that interim ruling came out. We know that we need to self-certify. We know that we're gonna have to develop a poem. We know that we're gonna have to start working towards chipping away at that poem. What we don't know is exactly when is this all gonna happen? Are our, if we submit scores, you know, I think the series of questions we're still trying to struggle with is if you submit a score to the Department of Defense, are they going to share that score with the prime? That has not been answered. Uh, it has not been answered whether they're going to restrict primes to only work with subs who have certain scores. That was what I was talking about earlier about how they're going to use your score and when that's going to change. And two, I think uh, the point that David made a second ago, we don't even know if they're looking at this data. And I can tell you with some confidence, they're certainly not looking at it anytime soon. It's too much data for the Department of Defense to handle, especially during COVID, especially with everything else going on. In all likelihood, this is just an exercise in bureaucracy of they can confirm you have submitted documents to them. However, I don't think that's going to be the case forever. I mean, I know it's not going to be the case forever. It's just a matter of when are we going to go from we all went through the exercise and submitted our documents to we're actually looking at them. There's a bar. You have to meet it. They're looking for progress. They're tracking. Have you changed since the last time you submitted? Or when are you going to have to re-self-certify? Those are all questions that I think we're all still kind of struggling with figuring out what is the real impact going to be. And so we're trying to pay very, very close attention. I mentioned there's a couple of uh, organizations that are following this and writing really good interpretations of the legal language, but also trying to pay attention to posturing by the DOD and, and actually what case study and what kind of actual events are happening to try to pinpoint where is this going. Um, but it is a little bit of a moving target. And the best thing we can do is focus on the parts we do know. So that's the interim self-certification that we need to deal with. And that's that we do need to get on our CMMC journey. When exactly we need to be at what level is a question mark, but we know that by December 2025, we have to have our certification completed. So the point that I made earlier is find out where your customers are in their journey, find out what their timelines look like. And my best advice would be to try to mimic and follow that along. So the other thing uh, that we do know is that there's going to be there are other regulations that apply to our business outside of the CMMC NIST organization. And I think as manufacturers, oftentimes we get a little bit of tunnel vision where when we think about compliance, we only think about the, the compliance that is specific to manufacturing. For better or for worse, manufacturers have a lot of other compliance that they need to deal with. Uh, at a minimum, we have this kind of deadline coming up of uh, November 30, 2020, not coming up now in our past. The next date that we know we've got coming up is the November 30th, 2025 date. Um, but as we go into 2021, there are other certifications that we need to be keeping track of that are applicable to probably just about everybody on this call. So I just want to kind of quickly cover those so that we don't kind of only focus on the specific manufacturing ones. The first is the Massachusetts, 2MR, uh, Massachusetts 201 CMR 17. For anybody who's not familiar with it, this is the Massachusetts data privacy law. That's what it's often referred to. It applies to any business who has employees in Massachusetts. Uh, it can also apply if you have any customers in Massachusetts. So if even if you're a business operating in Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, if you have customers or employees in Massachusetts, it's very, very, very likely that you are required to be in compliance with this particular law. This particular law, uh, like the California one that went to effect this year, 
is a state specific law meant to protect the residents of that state or commonwealth in the case of Massachusetts. It's not an incredibly onerous law, but there are very specific things you have to be doing. And we find a lot of companies, unfortunately, especially manufacturers tend to not be doing them. I think again, because they're super focused on the mass on the compliance for their industry and they lose the broader compliance. So the big things that you would know if you're compliant with this law, you would have a document on file called a WISP or written information security plan. The state requires in order to be compliant, you have to have this document. They also require that once a year you have to review that document and update it. And you actually have to keep like a, a change log book that reflects this person on this date reviewed it and made any changes or updated it. So you have to have a proof that you looked at it once a year. In addition to those things, you also have to do training for your employees on what's called protected personal information. Uh, PI is the state often uses the acronym. Any PI that your business comes in contact with, your employees have to be trained on how to handle that information. And you have to be able to document the existence of that training. You also have to have a written policy around the handling of personal information. Typically, this is a clause in your employee handbook that talks specifically about the handling of personal information amongst your employees within your organization. Those are kind of the big things. There's a bunch of other smaller little stuff that involved in the Mass CMR 17, but those are the big things that if you are compliant, you would know it because you'd have that WISP, it'd be reviewed once a year, um, and you would have that employee training going on in your business. If you don't, um, that is an important law to pay attention to. It came out in 2009, so this isn't new. Uh, you can't kind of plead ignorance anymore. On top of that, if there is a situation where there is any kind of a breach of data within your network, which I can talk about in a second, is just a matter of when, not if. When you have any kind of a breach, if it is found out, the law requires that you report that breach to the Attorney General's office. When you do so, the Attorney General is gonna ask for your written information security plan, your change log, your employee handbook insert, and your training program. Their evaluation, of how seriously you are taking your compliance with this law is going to directly impact the fine the Attorney General imposes on your company. The Attorney General's office has the ability to impose a fine of up to $5,000 per breached information. So if you lost an employee list that had 100 employees on it, you could get stuck paying a fine of up to 100 times $5,000. And that goes to the state. Then, as is the nature in the world we live, there are a whole bunch of attorneys who sit and watch those public filings because they are public filings. And the second they see one, they round up everybody who's impacted and they file a class action civil lawsuit against your business for not protecting the privacy of those individuals. So typically it ends up being kind of a double whammy. You get hit first by the state for this uh, on the criminal side, and then you get hit on the civil side from the people who were impacted. What we have seen is the more compliant you were, the better a job the attorney general office determines you were doing, the lower the fine. And what we have also seen is the lower your fine is with the attorney general's office, the lower the civil lawsuits end up being. Because basically the attorneys, the ambulance chasers who are watching this, if they see the attorney general's office didn't find you anything or only find you a small amount, that's gonna come out in the civil lawsuit and it's going to paint a picture that you didn't actually do much wrong. If they find you the maximum fine, it's the exact opposite. It basically shows that you were neglect and that neglect is gonna play out in the civil lawsuit. So we've seen those two things go hand in hand. Um, and again, that does impact anybody who has an employer or a customer in Massachusetts. On a similar front, and I won't go into as much detail on it right now, California came out with their version of a data privacy law um, in 2019, and it went to effect at the beginning of this year. It's called the California Consumer Privacy Act. Some of you may have heard of GDPR, which is the law that Great Britain uh, passed, which has been viewed as like an extreme version of a data privacy law. California's was mimicked after GDPR. So it's not quite as bad as GDPR, but it's right up there. It's a very, very difficult law to be in compliance with. 
Uh, probably one of the most challenging pieces is it has this kind of right to be forgotten element where if a individual wants their information totally removed from your system, they can make that request and you have to honor that request. Now, for a lot of people, their systems aren't designed for that. And so that can be a very onerous thing to try to implement. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the California one because it only impacts you if you have customers or employees in California. I think this, there's a smaller chance of that, although I'm sure there are people on the call who this does apply to. But that is one that you do need to educate yourself and be aware of if you do any business in California or have any employees who live in the state of California. Um, and that law is more onerous than the Massachusetts one. The good news is, because I know that all sounds like bad news, if you get a good handle on those two laws, you are almost by de facto compliant with every other state's data privacy law. So the reason we talk about Mass in California so much is Mass covers you for about 40 of the 50 states. Then the other, some states don't have a data privacy law, and then you have California. So if you don't have to deal with California and you just take care of the Massachusetts one, you have covered yourself from almost every state's perspective with the exception of California, and then obviously the states that don't have data privacy laws. So we talk mostly about those only because they're really good benchmarks of, let's figure out, do you need to deal with California? If not, great, let's just deal with mass, get mass done, and then you're pretty much done from the state compliance perspective. Um, so that's why it's a good kind of bellwether in terms of managing your data privacy at the state level. So with all of that said, uh, where I kind of want to go with the remainder of our time together, and then I will certainly open it up for as many questions as you guys have, is what is the process you should follow? How do you go about, from wherever you are today, getting to where you need to be to address the different compliance organizations? And I didn't talk about all of them. There are a few others. There's PCI, which is for anybody who touches any credit card data. There's a compliance organization out there called PCI, which governs the data protection of people's credit cards. And there's a few other ones uh, that are a little bit more either very, very industry specific um, or very, very case specific. Um, but the big ones you need to worry about are the state's data privacy laws, NIST, and then now CMMC. So how do you go about it? What's the right course? The first thing we always recommend is starting with an assessment. Uh, and an assessment is a great way to just understand where are we at today? What are we supposed to be compliant with? and how are we doing it being compliant with those different organizations? Uh, and then assessment's then gonna go one step further of really looking at within the compliance organizations like NIST and the Mass Data Privacy Law, how are you doing within the law itself? And so for example, uh, to the point earlier, you can meet the current NIST requirement no matter what your score is simply by doing the score and certifying it. But it is important to know what is the score and what were the things that were contributing to it being negative or what are the things that are preventing it from being um, 100% because it will need to be 100% to go on your CMMC journey. By step three, you have to be meeting those 110 requirements. So it's good to first of all figure out, are we meeting it from a paperwork perspective? Have we filed the documents? Do we have the stuff where it's supposed to be regardless of how good they look? Then we got to look at, okay, now for the things that aren't good, what isn't good? What are the actual problems? What would it take to fix those problems? And like most things, the more data and education we can get at the beginning, the clearer a picture we can see of what is the plan going to look like to get us where we want to go. So an assessment's a great way to do that. A very comprehensive assessment that comes in to assess the state and quality of the actual IT infrastructure itself, and then assesses which compliance bodies you're supposed to be maintaining, and then assesses how well you're in compliance with the current regulations, as well as what the known future regulations are for the ones that have already been published. Once we've got that done, we can start to figure out the plan. And the plan is all about what do we want to get done by when? As I mentioned, CMMC, we have potentially till 2025, depending on what our primes are doing and what our customers are doing. The mass data privacy law, technically we should have done 10 years ago. So we should probably get up to speed on that one. The California one's new. So we have a little bit of kind of leeway there to figure out, does that apply to us and how and what do we need to do there? So kind of looking at all of it and starting to put together that plan, because if you try to bite the whole thing off at once, it's overwhelming. It's a lot to tackle. And this is where the poems can come in really nice, is that plan can align really nicely with the requirement to come up with a poem anyway. That is kind of your plan that says, this is what we're going to get done. And these are the milestones that we're looking to achieve. And those milestones fit nicely into like, by next quarter of this year, by, by next quarter of, of next year, by the last quarter of next year, et cetera. So we can start to kind of put some framework around that. 
The other thing that's important is to figure out who's going to do what by when. Some of these requirements are going to be policy requirements. Policy requirements, for the large, most part, have to be implemented by you as the business owner. They can, we can create documents, we can work with you to create information, but at the end of the day, you're going to be the one to implement those policies and for the most part, train your employees on those policies. So this master plan needs to do a really good job of identifying, here's all the stuff that we have to do, here's who's going to do it, here's when it's going to be done by, here's how it's going to be done, and here's how much it's going to cost, so that we can start to build a multi-year plan for this. As soon as you get to this step, the whole thing feels so much less overwhelming because now you know what it's going to look like. You know how much to budget for each year. You can move things around to make the least amount of impact on your P&L. You can think about how to take advantage of different tax situations and different losses. You can feel much more in control of the entire thing once you get to this stage. So again, the kind of two pieces leading up to this is first of all, you got to get that assessment. We got to get all the data on the table so that nothing is unknown. And then we take all that data and we turn it into a nice plan that we all can feel good about that helps us understand where we're going. From there, uh, we need to come up with all the things that have to get done. So now we have the plan, we start to build the task list, the individual kind of punch list of all the things that have to happen. Uh, and one of the most common questions we get is what kinds of stuff are going to have to be done by my business in order to get me compliance. And it ranges. There's going to be improvements that you're going to have to make to your network. So I think the thing you probably are thinking of is there's going to be IT security improvements. You might have to get a better firewall. You might have to get a better email filtering system. You might have to have a better password policy. There will be things you have to do at an IT level. Then there's going to be training requirements. And I've alluded to these a couple of times. There'll be things that you have to train your employees on. And you don't have to come up with that training. A lot of that training can be given to you, but you will have to then take it and give it to your employees and do some sort of record keeping system to show that we trained our employees on this policy on this day, they signed off on it, or maybe they took this little quiz. We have some sort of proof that this actually happened. Then there's gonna be policies that you need to adopt both for your employees and for your vendors. So for example, the Mass Data Privacy Law has a very specific requirement that any vendor you have who interacts with your data has to sign a document that says that they understand your policy around data privacy and that they're going to abide by your policy, not their own policy. Um, so that's another you know, requirement that you need to have those policies and the policies need to be given to all the right people and they all need to be signed off and documented the right way. Then there's going to be probably some services you may have to sign up for that maybe you don't have right now. At the farthest extremes, some of you who want to get the highest level of CMMC certification are going to have to have 24-hour monitoring of your network. You're going to have to have security professionals watching your network for any kind of cyber incident that's going on in real time. Most of you won't ever get to quite that level, but there likely will be other services you have to add to your portfolio that you maybe don't have today, or maybe need to be beefed up a little bit, or maybe you have, but they're not really being paid attention to, and we need to tweak that a little bit. So those are kind of, I would say, the biggest buckets I would put stuff into. The IT improvements, like the hardware, the physical stuff, the policies, the trainings, and then some services that you may have to add. Most things that we have seen across all the different compliance bodies fits into one of those four buckets. What's great is that you do not have to do this alone. And I've alluded to this a couple of times. There are a lot of people out there who are experts in dealing with this. Um, that being said, as I've also alluded to, you can't outsource the entire thing. Partnership is really the way that you have to think about this. There are companies that can do the assessment, can tell you what has to be done, they can build the plan, they can make the checklist, but there will be roles that you have to play. You are going to have to, for example, maybe implement a training for your employees or hand a policy to a vendor and make them sign it. There will be things that you have to work with your vendors and outsource partners on in order to get this done. And when everybody works together, it works really well. Uh, where we find the outside partner can be very helpful is to really make sure that everything is being tracked and managed and that there is a plan and that people are being held accountable to it. Because I don't have to tell you guys, you have a lot on your plate and of all the things you're worried about and thinking about and dealing with, this is probably this much capacity uh, to devote toward this particular topic. And so what you really want is somebody to take all the legwork and manual research and thought process out of it and boil it down to, you need to do these five things this year, these 10 things next year, and you're going to have to write these checks. That's honestly what it comes down to. And if you can do these five things and write this check and budget for this amount, then you can be compliant by this day, or we can get to this milestone, or we can stay on track with the poem that we developed. How 
However, I will say when it comes to selecting that partner, uh, you do need to be careful. Uh, and the reason is because I've just illustrated for you guys how many different moving parts there are, how many government entities, how many different things happening, and it can very much feel like hurting cats. What you want is a partner who's going to take that responsibility from you, not just be one service provider within that spectrum. And the difference is who's gonna general contract this? Do you want to be the general contractor trying to keep track of everything that's going on, knowing what everybody needs to be doing, making sure they're doing it by the deadline, maintaining and managing the project? Or do you wanna be one of the product resources who's assigned a couple of tasks and your job is to complete your tasks that have been assigned to you? We have seen a lot of firms who are cybersecurity experts or who are compliance experts who will come in and they'll tell you everything you have to do, but then they walk away and they just give you the blueprint. It's like hiring an architect to design a house. It's great to have the blueprint, but now you still need a general contractor to build the house. What you don't want to do is get stuck being that general contractor. So I would kind of caution you against firms that their job is just to come in and pay them a lot of money to tell you all the things you have to do and then kind of give that to you and walk away and say, if there's anything we can help with, just let us know. That can put a lot of onus on you and that often is gonna to lead to these compliances getting behind schedule and not getting done by time because you have a lot on your plate and this is not probably the most important thing. The other thing that we'll sometimes see is plans, people who come in and they only know one perspective of it. So they start kind of doing work in a vacuum that also can lead to a lot of problems. If you have one vendor who's doing work in a vacuum and not in concert with the other work that's going on, you could end up spending double money, wasting resources, having to go forward and then backward. Um, and so it is important to have kind of one person overseeing the entire compliance picture. The last thing you don't want to do is leave you in the middle where Everybody kind of is pointing to you saying, hey, how come you didn't do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? We see that happen. I'm sure you guys end up in that position half of your day anyway. You don't need it to be the case for this particular thing as well. So that's kind of, and again, obviously this is a, a a webinar hosted by Paragus, and so I'll give you a shameless promotion for Paragus. Uh, this is the kind of work that we can do. We're not the only ones that can do it, and there are other people who I'm sure do a great job. We are obviously biased in the sense that we think we're pretty great, uh, but we are a firm who can do this kind of work. And the approach that we take, just to help you understand it a little bit, is a very comprehensive approach. As I alluded to earlier, we start off with that assessment. Let's understand everything and anything related to kind of where you're at in your journey, but also where your network is at, where your systems are at. Let's really understand the current state of uh, affairs because that's gonna give us a lot of really good information. From there, we can build the plan. And I alluded to the plan earlier, who's gonna do what by when, how is it gonna happen, how much is it gonna cost, really giving you that kind of um, confidence that you know how you're gonna get there, who's gonna be doing what, what you're responsible for, what it's gonna cost, what year it's gonna fall into, even the potential what quarter it's gonna fall into. Then we can product manage it. So we can make sure that everybody who has a role to play in that plan, has knows what they have to do and when they have to do it, and we can hold them accountable to that. Yes, that might mean sending you a couple of emails like, hey, we still need you to complete that. We don't mind being that kind of annoying pester, uh, but we'll give you as few responsibilities as we have to and take on as many as we can on our own or delegate them to other people. Uh, but ultimately, we can be the ones to make sure that everybody knows where we're at and that they're all doing their part to get us to the end of the day. Um, but then we go a little bit further than that. One of the things that we can also do is in addition to kind of coming up with this plan, we can provide the training documents and policy documents that you're going to need for a lot of this um, uh, compliance. So there are very specific, in some cases, depending on which compliance you're going for, there could be 20 different compliance policies that you need to have. A BYOD policy, an acceptable use policy, a handling of confidential information policy, a building access policy. There's a lot of legal policies. We have them all. We can take them, template them for you, customize it a little bit to fit your business and give you those policies so you don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch because that can be very expensive and time consuming, um, especially if you're paying a lawyer $500 an hour to write those policies for you. I highly do not recommend that. Um, beyond that, we can also then manage the network. So as you can imagine, IT is a moving target. Doing all this work is not a snapshot in time activity. Every time you do an assessment, it's going to have changed a little bit from the last time you did that assessment. Our job is to not just do the work to help you get compliant, it's to help steer the network towards the direction of that compliance. And that's where there's a lot of efficiency to be gained. 
if one organization is managing your technology and somebody else is managing your compliance, they're not always going to be handed in concert. And that's what I was talking about earlier. I was alluding to there can be wasted resources, wasted time, lack of efficiency. And ultimately, there can be finger pointing back at you because you're in the middle of two different vendors. Our goal is to make sure that we know where you're trying to go. And then we're steering your day-to-day -day IT in that direction and making sure that nothing that's happening on a day-to-day -day level puts you further away from your plan. And that whenever there is a decision that has to be made, we make the decision that puts you closer to the realization of your ultimate certification plan that you've put together with us. But wait, there's more. Uh, and what I mean by that is, as I've mentioned earlier, we're also an outsourced IT firm. And then that's what I was talking about at the beginning of this presentation beyond helping you with this journey, which in and of itself is a significant amount of work, we're also your full IT vendor. Uh, what that means is that we have a department that's helping you with your IT strategy. What equipment should I buy? How can I become more productive? How can I be more automated? How can I reduce my licensing cost? How can I make it so that we can work remotely more effectively for our office employees? What can I do to better use technology to make my business faster, smarter, more efficient, leaner, insert buzzword here. Um, there is a lot that technology can do. And most organizations don't have that advisor, that consultant helping them realize how to use technology to make your organization better. Then there's the proactive side. This is where compliance fits in for us, but it's also where security fits in, backups, business continuity, all the things that are technically preventable work that we can do in advance to help your organization stay stable. Our goal is that our clients are up 100% of the time so that they're not encountering downtime in their operation. I don't have to tell you guys how expensive that is, how disruptive that is. You start missing customer orders, you start getting complaints. It's a cascading domino effect. Our job is to make sure that if it could have been prevented, it was prevented and that we have a team of people standing by to watch that. Then on the reactive side, this is the team of people who, when you do have a problem, need to be available to instantly help you. If something is down, if somebody can't do their job, you need to be able to call in real time, get somebody who's going to jump on that problem and take care of it for you. And we have an entire team of people. In fact, we probably have the biggest team in the Western Mass area of people dedicated to doing this exact service. And then we have our products team. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of these projects or a lot of these compliance uh, projects are in fact a project. We have actual project managers who are professional product managers managing that project. Not a technician who's kind of acting as a product manager, not an account rep who's gonna keep an eye on it, but a professional product manager who's going to manage it like a project um, and make sure that everything gets done on time make sure there's a scope of work, make sure there's a budget, make sure everybody's being held accountable, and make sure that at the end of the day, we meet the original goals we set out to meet. And then the last thing I'll show you just about Paragus is what makes us for unique is not only do we have those services, but how we deliver those services to our clients. We assign a four-person team to every single client. Most IT companies at best are going to give you an account rep. Maybe they give you two people. We're going to assign you a four-person team. One person who's your account relationship manager helping you with that strategy, a network manager who's in charge of your security, compliance, and backups, a client support manager who's overseeing all of the reactive support we're providing you and your team, and then a product manager to step in and manage each and every project that we end up doing with you. That four-person team works collaboratively together on a portfolio of clients, and that's all they do. So they're constantly meeting and talking about their portfolio. Hey, I saw this is happening at this company. Can you reach out and let them know that we should reevaluate that? Have you noticed this trend? We should make sure they know about that. It's really a team of people who's acting as your professional, personal outsourced IT department, uh, much like a big corporation would have internally. And then the last thing I just want to kind of drop a nugget for is an upcoming webinar that we're going to be doing on 365 and especially looking at it through a productivity lens. One of the things that you guys should start to have on your radar is most of you are probably consumers of 365 right now at some level. Maybe your email is there. Maybe it's how you're licensing Microsoft Office, but you're probably starting to touch Microsoft 365. If you're not, I can make a very compelling reason why you should. and We can talk about that offline. But what you're probably not doing is leveraging 365 to make your business more productive and efficient. It is an amazing platform to do so. And one of the webinars that we'll be doing uh, next month is really helping business owners understand this incredible powerhouse of a tool they have available to them. I mean, to use manufacturing, it's like having the latest, greatest CNC machine and only using it for a very, very small fraction of what it's designed for. 
there's an enormous amount of potential there. You could do a lot with 365. And this webinar will help to just start to open your eyes to what's possible and show you why that strategic piece of it is so important, having somebody help you to leverage technology. So with that, I, uh, we've got exactly 10 minutes left to answer any and all questions that any of you have about anything we presented today or just anything at all uh, IT related. I just want to mention to all you uh, business owners that um, don't try to do the CMMC alone. Um, I've been helping two companies get through this for the past eight months, whenever they announced it. And, you know, I've written 600 pages with my documents and gone through, you know, the poems alone or because it's NIST, NIST um, 800-171 plus another like 25 controls. So it's a really big project. It's something you really want to get some sort of IT person behind you. Um, because if you try to do it alone, just the acronyms alone, you get lost. So I just figured I'd throw that out there. It's a, it's a big project. It's a lot of work. Yeah, I couldn't agree with David more. It is, and it's, what's really frustrating about it is it's a hard thing to only learn, to only have to do once. So there's no point in going through the educational to get a thesis in CMMC to use it one time. Let somebody else be the one who learns everything, who studies everything, who figures it out, and then let them use that expertise to help make it as efficient uh, and seamless for you as possible. Because I can guarantee you there's a lot of better places for you to invest that time and energy that's going to have a much bigger ROI in your bottom line than becoming an expert in CMMC documentation. That said, though, when you look through the different controls, they leave numbers out. So it'd be like 126, and then it goes to 130. So you know at some point they're going to add more controls. <clears throat> so it's uh, it will be a fluid document. I'm sure they'll keep adding things as years go on. So I figured there... I'd throw that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Any other questions from anybody about anything we went over today? One question we get all the time uh, is how expensive is it to get through these different certification processes? It's an impossible question to answer. It's gonna depend entirely on where you're at today, what the state of your IT systems are, what level of certification you're trying to obtain and by when. Those are the major variables. Um, I think that's also where an assessment can come in really handy is we can start to figure out in much more specific terms, what it actually is going to look like, both in terms of a timeline and a cost. But it's gonna vary significantly. Um, I'll give you one example though. The CMMR, CMR 17, the Massachusetts Data Privacy Law, on average, we can get a client certified with that data compliance for probably around, I would say $750 is probably pretty typical. So between $750 and $1,000, you can at least say, okay, I've got my Massachusetts data privacy taken care of. I'm not worried about that one anymore. And as a reminder, if you have that done, you're compliant with most of the state's data privacy laws. So that can be a good one to get checked off and out of the way to know that, okay, now I don't have to think about that. I don't have to think about the attorney general's office finding me all this money. Um, I've got that one on her hand. Now I can shift my focus to NIST, CMMC, California, if you have to deal with it, GDPR, if you have to deal with it, any of the other organizations that you're going to have to face or deal with. Any other final questions before we close up here? Uh, somebody looks like they're talking on mute. There Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. That's Dave Lubucky from Rock Valley Tool. Um, we touched on this a long time ago. I'm new to this too, and Liz and Jason, you know, we're getting into this. Is there a deadline we have to be on? Could you just remind me or touch yeah, on so that? the dates? The dates to know are that right now, if you want to bid on any new contract that is a DOD contract, okay. you need to have done the self-assessment. So this, that date was November 30th of this year. So that date's come and gone. So going forward, all new contracts will require that you have done the self-certification. That one is not so onerous. It's not a huge deal. It's just, you need to go through the 110 requirements, score yourself, and then you'll submit that data 
it, it the minimum to the DOD and then maybe also your prime if they ask for it. Right. So that's the first date. The only other date that's a hard deadline that we have is November 2025. By then, you will have to have completed your CMMC certification. What we don't know is between now and November 2025, when CMMC is going to start to be required. Different contracts could start to implement requiring it really at any point, but the DOD has indicated that not in 2021. The 2021 is really going to be about trying to let organizations get certified and that maybe by 2022, you might start to see this introduced on some contracts. But the only two hard dates we have were November 30th, 2020 for the self-certification requirement. So that is now effective. And then November of 2025, we know that you're going to have to have CMMC for any new contract. All right. Thank you. I have a question on similar to what he was saying on the scoring on this, the NIST. Um, When it gives a value, say the value is five. So you scoring yourself anywhere from one to five? Or is it all pass fail and you get the one point if you're doing it and minus five if you don't? The latter. Yeah, there's no gradient. So if you meet the requirement, you get the score. If you don't meet the requirement, you don't. So it's not like a range of one to five. Okay, so it's a pass fail, but that's how many points each thing is worth. Yeah, it's a weighted tool to make sure that some things hurt you more than other things, not meant to be a range. Okay, all right. And the weight you can kind of interpret as the importance from NIST perspective of on that particular item, uh, what they're deeming the importance of it to be. Okay. And where where do you send this off to? I can actually, when we send out the recap of this, I'll share the actual very specific Navy email address that you're supposed to use. Uh, So I'll make sure we get that out to everybody. Um, And again, the interim ruling says that you should take your, uh, there's like six things that you're gonna put. Um, you're going to put your NIST score, you're going to put your poem, you're going to put a couple of other documents so they can define you and put you into the system. And those things all get submitted to that email address. They also strongly recommend that you send that via encrypted email um, because it is very sensitive data. Um, so the Navy is suggesting, not requiring, but suggesting you submit that through an encrypted email platform. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, certainly it's a question that somebody can help you with. And then, as I said earlier, your prime could also ask you for it. Um, And if they asked you for it, they would ask you for something specifically, like we want to see your NIST self-assessment, or we want to see your poem, or we want to see both. And that's entirely their discretion. They're not required to ask for those things, but I think you're going to see more and more primes start to ask for them from a liability coverage perspective. They're going to want to be making sure that they know what their supply chain state is. And it's probably more likely that if your prime asks for it, they're actually going to look at it. Whereas I don't think the DOD is really going to look at these scores right now. Not any more than a cursory, like, okay, yes, he submitted it. It's filled out correctly. Um, But that's partly what we're going to be paying very close attention to. And if we see enough information come out um, that would warrant a second iteration of one of these webinars, like an update webinar, we'll certainly put one together. Uh, We're following this very closely and paying attention to a couple different sources. So if more information comes out that's really relevant, that changes any of the conversation we've had today, we'll certainly make sure that we get that out to you guys. All right. Well, with that, I will end uh, exactly at 12 o'clock. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. We will send out a copy of this presentation with the email address for the self-assessment. And if there's any questions or anything we can ever do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, We're happy to help any way that we can. You'll be emailing us about the 365 by any chance? Uh, Yes. Um, If you sign up for this webinar, you will now be on the invite list for that 365 webinar we will be doing in January. Great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Look forward to it. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.